do we realize that something is wrong in a world where there are so many farm workers without land, so many families without a home, so many laborers without rights, so many persons whose dignity is not respected? Do we realize that something is wrong when so many senseless wars are being fought and acts of fratricidal violence are taking place on our very doorstep? Do we realize something is wrong when the soil, water, air, and living creatures of our world are under constant threat? So let us not be afraid to say it. Of the many wise words from Pope Francis this year, these words I find most inspiring. They are a challenge to people of faith everywhere. Over the years, I have been to too many meetings with religious leaders, have had far too many discussions, taken too many resolutions, have signed too many petitions, not to know that we, as we are gathered here tonight, do know very well that something is wrong. And it is more wrong now than it was 10 or 20 years ago. The time has come for us not to be afraid to say it. And I'm not talking about mentioning the wrongs that we see. I'm talking about how we say it, with faithfulness to those who suffer, with truth, with courage, and with compassion. The wrongs we see are not just happening, they are made to happen. And they are happening to the vast majority of God's children walking this earth. They're not happening randomly, they are deeply systemic, deliberately built into systems of oppression, domination, and dehumanization, and we must not be afraid to say it. These words mean that the Pope knows that because the perpetrators of these wrongs are powerful and rich and privileged, we sometimes speak a language guaranteed not to give offense. We speak a language couched in such caution, such ambiguity, such fear, that it becomes almost meaningless. The comfortable are not afflicted by it, and the afflicted are not comforted by it. We must not only break the silence, we must speak a different language. A language must be a courageous, liberating, transformative, healing language, a counter language to the language of distortion and perversion of hate and violence, discrimination, and dehumanization of sanctimonious neutrality. It must be a language counter to the language of preemptive legitimation and post facto justification. We must be much more alert in our awareness of the fact that our global reality is an imperial reality. And we must be much more vigorous in our testimony and work against violence in all its forms. Empires. Walter Wink has reminded us, create not only the myth of domination, they also create the myth of redemptive violence. Instead of acknowledging the violence it uses because it is needed for continued domination and subjugation, the empire enshrines the belief that violence saves, that war brings peace, and that might makes right. Consequently, violence is not only necessary, they make us believe it's the only thing that works. If it is God is what one turns to when all else fails, Walter Wink says, violence certainly functions as a God. It demands from its devotees an absolute obedience unto death. It, and not any of the religions we proclaim, is the dominant religion of our societies today. Over against But we also know the deadly logic of the endless wars inflicted on millions of people, and this is the logic. Perpetual war that brings perpetual suffering and perpetual death, perpetual impoverishment, perpetual profits, perpetual enrichment. This is wrong, and we must not be afraid to say it. Over against the violent language of suppression and exclusion, we must speak the language of love and inclusion. But for the person of faith, the scourge of inclusion is inflicted upon all who are impressed. 
exploited and robbed of their dignity. Globally, one in three women will experience physical and or sexual violence by a partner or non-partner. For the Americas, it is 29.8%. For Europe, 25.4%. The Eastern Mediterranean, 37%. And Africa, 36.6%. Violence against women is a global health problem of epidemic proportions, says the World Health Organization. And we must not be afraid to say it. For us to be credible witnesses of our faith and of our belief in peace and justice and dignity for everyone, we must stand where God stands. And because God is a God of justice, compassionate, inclusive, indivisible justice, unless justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream for the battered, oppressed, silenced, exploited, and excluded women, it will not roll down for the economically excluded poor, the landless farmers, or the penniless unemployed. And we must not be afraid to say it. The brutal exclusion. The brutal exclusion of LGBTI persons, the assault upon their dignity as children of God made in the image of God, the daily threats to their very lives is one of the most devastating forms of violence we are seeing today. And we must not be afraid to say it. We must guard. We must guard against a religiosity that is ideological, new colonialist, a toxic mix of scriptural selectivity, violent homophobia, and unrelieved patriarchal power, and we must not be afraid to say it. We know, and we have seen this too often in our history, that behind the carefully calculated hatred the deliberate dehumanization, the calculated demonization, and the callous exclusion of the other lies the temptation of the deification of the self. And behind all self-deification lurks the necessity of the annihilation of the other. And we must not be afraid to say it. But now that we know this, we must also know that Dietrich Bonhoeffer has reminded us that the time for pious words is over. So let me ask you one more deeper question. Where are your wounds? My fellow countryman, Alan Payton, wrote a book in which he tells the story of a very cautious school principal in the days of the Soweto uprisings in 1976. Always afraid not to be seen with the children. But one day they saw him marching with the children and the other day they saw him on the stage speaking on behalf of the children and behalf of the cause of freedom. And his friend said to him, what has happened to you? And he said this, I thought about it and I know that one day when I die, I will appear before the great judge in heaven and the judge will ask me, where are your wounds? And if I say I have no wounds, he will say to me, was there then nothing to fight for? So tonight, that is the question I am asking you. Where are your wounds? When we see the pain and the suffering and the misery and everything that our people across the world must suffer, where are your wounds? And if you have no wounds, was there then nothing to fight for? So when we leave here and the speaking is done, the resolutions are taken, the petitions are signed, and you go back to home to face the misery, the dehumanization, the suffering, and the pain. And when you see the hope in the eyes of children and women and men who look to us for truth, compassion, and faithfulness, the question is not how well we have spoken in this place. The question is where are your wounds? And if you do not have any, was there then nothing to fight for? Thank you for listening. God bless you.